Welcome back to Junction 119. This is Kellen. And this is Kaysen. And Kaysen, I love how you started to queue up the train set, like the train sound effect before the show now. I, I oh, yeah. I tell you that. I love that. It's like you get, it's like you like the train before and after whatever it is that you've continued to do. But we're back. We have a really loaded lineup today. We're going to talk half football. We've got some uh, Marvel stuff to talk about. It's going to be a pretty heavy Marvel aspect things we had a few trailers come out we had uh, thunderbolts trailer come out and of course uh agatha all along has premiered uh we're gonna mm-hmm. get into that uh, i actually think three episodes case and will have come out by the time this show comes out but i've only seen yeah. the first two I'm yeah just yeah right we, out of the only, way we've only seen the first two at this point <laughs> so, yeah. uh so we're you know we're gonna talk about that later on but we begin case in with this ongoing story, which is new literally today. We're recording this on a Wednesday. I, I, of, it did break last night. It um, broke last night, but yeah. it really kind of took off and became a real big news story today in the sports world. We're going to start in college football because this ongoing saga with Matthew Sluka, who is the uh, starting quarterback of the 3-0 and UNLV Rebels, uh, you know, essentially making waves in the college space and NIL space today slash last night by saying that uh, he's done playing for the year and and most likely for UNLV as well. Uh, Initially, it was reported that he is not playing because NIL uh, agreements had not been met, uh, which essentially over the course of today, case, and I'm sure you saw cause pushbacks Mm -hmm. from their collective and other things. And in the last hour, I don't even know if you've, you've even seen this. I mean, there might be news broken before we're even done recording today. His teammate, the running back has now come out and said, yeah, I'm out too. Uh, but he has since said on like Twitter and other spaces that his is apparently not NIL related. Cause I think initially it was reported that it was. So who knows what's real, what's not. That was interesting because sometimes, especially with, with what I do for work case. And sometimes you see a story that, you know, is going to be on ESPN within like a few hours. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, Someone, someone in the ESPN labs is cooking up the graphic right now. And there it was like at 10 or, 10 or 12, 11 o'clock this morning. So um, your reaction to this, I mean, this is essentially the college equivalent of a quarterback holding out for more money. Uh, that's initially kind of what it seemed like. Yeah. I, it, mm-hmm. which we, we've seen a lot of in, in the NFL and this is the first uh, time we've seen it in college mm-hmm. so far. Um Obviously, I think it's a bit more than just that. Is it because he his claim is uh not new, like we have seen this before. If you remember, uh, Florida ran into issues with uh quarterback recruit Jaden Rashada, yes, where right. their their NIL uh collective promised him, I think it was like 10 million, 14 million dollars or something, and um, then backed out of it, so he decommitted, and so. I we we've seen that to where there's a lot of um verbal promises that aren't ever written down and so they're they're not being held up uh and so this is the first we've seen of allegedly a verbal commitment of x amount of money which I I believe it was 300k and then he's saying that uh he's only received $3000 um or or something along the lines of that um but yeah so it 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 is tricky i mean the what 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 we are seeing is that the way the nil is being handled by collectives by universities by players is unsustainable i mean well without without any type of contract or written agreement anywhere this type of stuff is going to end up happening a lot more frequently. Right. And we don't know all the details yet. It really is a, a one side, other side says situation right now. Yeah. But the reality of the situation of among some folks I talked to today and, and opinions, you know, both in kind of the office and out, you know, just kind of your water cooler discussions is if nothing was legally binding, well then quite literally, UNLV's running the the risk of him leaving at any time because they're not obligated to pay him. If it was just a handshake agreement, that's not binding. And that's something that like Sluka and others and agents should have made sure was legally binding uh, on the way in. Yeah. Now, I mean, and, 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 and yeah. since this, there, there's been a lot of other additional things coming out mm-hmm. to where 
it, it, where it's like, dude, like, why didn't your agent actually get this deal in writing? And then it's apparently come out that his agent isn't licensed to be an agent in Nevada. Um, well, so, so there's just a lot of issues here. The other I, thing, I, yeah. the, the other rule in the NCAA that this is running into, and this is where people who work in and out of college athletics, where I would think to myself, okay, this is one of those situations where we haven't seen this problem before, but are like, depending on how the system goes, are dudes allowed to just not play and declare it a red shirt, a red shirt season. If it's not a medical red shirt, like I literally don't know the full extent of the rules right now. And that was the yeah. conversation I had with multiple people today because yeah. get, like, is that something that can just be done? Because it goes back to that conversation of like uh, the, the idea of forcing someone to play, which I think we talked about on this show way back when it's like, I can't physically make you play, but it's like, if, for, if I was having a dispute, like, <clears throat> I, I mean, I can't, I, I'm allowed to physically just not go out there and participate. I, I mean, that that's a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> Because Wait, like, can you even do that? Like, <laughs> I like, like that is a really good point because I don't think I've ever seen that happen before. L to where like, a, a dude's just like, yeah, yeah, I'm not feeling it. I'm just redshirting this year. Yeah, I'm just like, gonna redshirt. Like, and I'm, I'm sorry, so what? I'm like, wait, medical redshirt means you have to have a medical well, professional to trigger that. But like, I, I think this is a dust off the this is a dust off the rule book situation. Well, like, okay, I, I, what, think, the, I think what do we even do here? <laughs> All the red shirt means is that you're not using your 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 eligibility. Your eligibility. Right. And so I think if he basically just quits the team and doesn't play, then that then like the the logic kicks in. So if he's if he's on scholarship and he just quits the team, voids the scholarship and leaves, then he can do whatever he wants. I, I right. mean, in in my understanding of the context, it's just nobody does that. It's like pocketing. So, it's like you pocket a year of eligibility. It's like yeah. Okay, I mean, it's I'll take it, this one with me. Yeah, I mean. It, you're you are running like it is running the risk of setting a pretty dangerous precedent now but i, 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 I did mean have... in 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 fairness though i i would like to see guys being willing to maybe something comes up in their personal life early in the season and they're just not in the headspace to actually play right we've seen like, we've seen guys leave because of mental health reasons i, like I, that I mean and, so, and that's essentially you know, a medical red shirt that yeah, is yeah i mean, I mean and, you know and so it, it would be it would be good, I think, for the for players who actually, you know, need it for for more reasons to 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 qualify for them. Saying, look, I, I I just can't do it this year. Right. I mean, I you know, I X Y and Z reasons. I'm not going to be able to give it my all or F focus family on this. issues come up. Yeah. You know, it's like for for any for any regular college student that might have to literally leave campus for something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. I, I honestly just kind of take this as we'll see how the story unfolds. I, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not throwing anyone under the bus or saying anyone did any wrongdoing because quite frankly, we don't know, but at the same time, it is this, these are the conversations that we have to have now, literally, because we've never had this problem or issue come up before, you know? Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and here's Mid -season. the other thing too. Mid season. Is that <laughs> th th this I think is only a bigger story because UNLV was on the tip of everybody's tongue for the last three days. Yeah. Because I, I was planning to have a very different conversation about UNLV today. Yes, you were. Until this too. happened. You're right. And so we can go ahead and segue into that. Yeah, let's transition is, into that. Which is officially, as of last night into today, Utah State is joining the other Mountain West teams in in joining the Pac-12. Uh, and leaving or the other ones we talked about. Um, departing the Mountain West. The, the departing the Mountain West ago. to go into the Pac-12, which means that they have seven members and they need one more, an eighth member. And it has been suggested that that eighth member was going to be UNLV because they sort of initially agreed to uh, staying with the Mountain West, but they didn't sign anything because it was contingent upon everybody else staying. And with Utah State leaving, they were pursuing the, op the opportunity and considering it. And so... In the context of this whole situation, I mean, like yeah. I, I don't know. I, I mean, like if if you need to pay your players more money, <laughs> that Pac-12 money could go pretty far. Well, and that's I, we're right exactly. Like in in other words, it's like, look, we can attract. We we have these kind of situations. We're definitely a Pac-12 school. I'm kidding, of course, but uh, but no, I I, I agree. Although th I mean, th this is definitely a Pac-12 type of news story. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with you, actually. 
Uh, I, I exactly. And to, and to comment on that, it was kind of wild, like in the last two days, how it, it seemed that the second the Pac-12 made those decisions, like made it public that these schools were in talks, multiple of them, uh, or excuse me, the conferences of the American and the um, the American Mountain West and others have essentially kind of said, well, they haven't had conversations with us yet. Mountain West, I believe they had been informed by the institutions. But, you know, with these other schools being talked about, people are talking about Air Force to the American. The Americans like nothing's been agreed to. The weirdest thing that, though, was reported yesterday that we kind of had a brief back and forth about is Gonzaga basketball only to the Pac-12, potentially leaving the Western Collegiate Conference or whatever, that one, that conference shot back immediately and said, well, whoa, wait a minute. And essentially yeah. they there'll be a basketball only member of the league and they won't and they're they're not having to essentially be penalized because they don't have football. My brain immediately they, they, went, they, they would have yeah, like, they would have received a full uh, like yeah. a full media contract rights like amount for only being basketball for only being or, or, basketball or, 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 i guess i guess or, they, well i think it was everything everything but, being but they don't have football yeah. right right and my, you, correct thanks man and and i will say that like, my brain immediately said okay tell me you're desperate for members without telling me you're desperate for members. i mean I, i'm kidding of course but like strategically i think even you off the air said that like gonzaga that would actually make sense if they wanted to get into like a higher profile like conference I, no i mean i mean it, it it would definitely elevate the the basketball side of it um i mean i don't know for sure how good at gonzaga is at the other sports you know like soccer or whatever i don't know sure. how they are that. but i mean if you if you want to talk about basketball and you know pac-12 basketball is a is a is a legacy you know brand um the G gonzaga being a part of that would be huge but yeah i i don't know i mean my my thought i i well i think so Brett McMurphy announced it, and then like immediately, some of the people were like, "No, this isn't happening. There have been no talks." I, my thought process is that I think there was a couple informal conversations with the Pac-12, with you know, you know, the, the Washington State and Oregon State people, and and maybe somebody from Gonzaga, and there were maybe hemming and hawing about maybe the the proportion of of the the revenue they would the revenue split they would get and i think that this leak was probably a way from for gonzaga to um i honestly i don't know what way it would influence it i mean i think it would it was a leak from either side to influence the the revenue split mm. negotiation cuz i i don't even know who would who would win in that situation like i don't i don't know if it would be the I don't know if Gonzaga was asking for a full revenue share, and so the Pac-12 leaked it to show that they're that that's such a joke, or if it was the other way around to where I see what you mean. Gonzaga yeah. was like I'm not sure who wins in that negotiation, but the only makes the only thing that makes sense is that it was a conversation that happened, and one party leaked it to Brett McMurphy to influence the negotiation on that. That yeah. is the only thing that makes sense to me. I agree. I, mean, I do agree with that. It does make it does seem like one way or the other. Either way, and also I think almost to gauge public opinion on that, and say like, yeah, it it, yeah. it definitely could have been a trial balloon on that. I mean, I I I think it's a, it would be a great thing. I mean, oh, the, I, agree. I think it's a great move for Gonzaga. I, I mean, you know. I, I I would imagine the West Co the West Coast Conference would want them gone because they just dominate everything. Well, I actually thought about that. Like, I know they're they're a really attractive thing, but if you're any other team in that league, and they've had other in in that conference, I should say. They've had other teams be good, but now it really opens up. Like they might even change the tournament format if Gonzaga is no longer in there. Because well, remember, for I the mean, longest I, I guess... time, it had to be like Gonzaga could win it with like two wins in that tournament, yeah. and everyone else had to well, go like I, I guess six I or seven. They probably don't yeah. want them gone. They probably don't want them gone because Gonzaga gets like four units every every year of March Madness revenue. Well, right, and so like who else would do that? Like. Well, I, reliably, I, who else would win three games? I mean, every I, March? I think St. Mary's College in California is also in that in that conference. So I guess they're the most immediate dominant basketball school that comes. I don't know. It could be yeah. anyone. But the bottom line is that, you know, the, it opens that up a little bit more, especially when uh, just, you know, I think his name is Mark Few, the head coach there, built Gonzaga basketball from like mid-major yeah. to what they are now. I mean, it's really kind of amazing. So. We'll see what happens there right now. Nothing is set in stone again in that story. Let us know your thoughts. Uh, some interesting things happening. I just find it fascinating that we have gotten to the point in realignment where 
schools are just talking to, to conferences and vice versa without even discussing their own leagues. Like as, as, as funny as it is in like, say like the college football 25 video game to make your custom conferences, it almost kind of feels like that's like real life now. Like, Hey, yeah, you know what? Let's yeah, just join no, this league 100%. and everything yeah. that comes with it. Let's just, let's just switch leagues. And it doesn't matter what legally binding contract we're in. Let's just, let's which, just... which I will say it is very funny though. I, I don't know if this is real. I, I don't know, but mm-hmm. I, I saw something going around on, on Twitter that was the, basically the contract of the, the, the scheduling agreement with the, with Washington state and Oregon state, the scheduling agreement with mountain West that included the, the rules for their buyout um, or the, the rules for penalties that they had to pay if they poached other Mountain West schools. Mm. And I, I don't know if it was real, but it I mean, it made sense that it, it basically had broken down the amount that they had to pay for every school that they stole. And like, it, it got incrementally <laughs> more expensive for every school that they got. Like the first school was 10 million. Then it went to like 10, five and then, 11 like it just got more and more expensive just the more schools that they got just we need they're paying mark downing jr's base marvel contract per school quite literally yeah, 10 yeah. million dollars to even appear which is what he had at his peak <laughs> so <laughs> that's the face that's where the, that's where negotiations start by the way so yeah it, yeah hey, so, least, so at I, least those are like in there so like i think at this point they have to pay like over 60 million dollars to the mountain west for stealing these six schools or whatever yeah and it, uh, probably to be more soon five, the, so, the five schools whatever right yeah. so uh we'll see what happens uh i i just uh, the 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 idea that almost sounds like our version of transfer fees in, in soccer where the club's got to yeah. pay a hundred million pounds for even starting negotiations well that's the thing is that, that that's not <laughs> even the buyout that the schools themselves have to pay to, oh my to, gosh okay that, so that's just that, that's that's literally just a penalty that the conference of the that the Pac-12 conference has to pay the Mountain West conference for stealing their schools. And then there's another 10 million, I think, per school. And that's the so it's like on the schools. It, it, it was I don't know who in their right mind thought that signing this agreement would have been a good idea if they knew that that was what they were going to do anyway. Like if, if well, like if well, you knew you were going to try and try and poach this conference. Right. Why did you agree to pay them 60 million dollars? Right, right. But whoever when that contract was drafted up, realignment was not what's happening now by any means. Well, it, it was, I mean, the contract was drafted up six months ago. Oh, I didn't realize that that was that recent. Yeah. I, I mean, so, once all the, like bad. they, they signed that scheduling agreement last year, they like, must whatever, have... when, like whenever the, they made that agreement to play the mountain West schools. Cause they didn't have a conference anymore. Well, if you're on the receiving end of that money, you look very smart. So, I mean, I, we'll see. I, uh, I want to shift to a different college sports story. This was just a wild story that came out. Uh, from the the weekend that was college football. If you if you're out there and you probably have already heard this story before, but I haven't talked to you about it, Kason. And and a lot of the time, this show is just I want to talk to Kason about this stuff anyway. So let's hit record and talk about it. That's basically our show in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and I will say that uh, if you didn't see James Madison and North Carolina put on an offensive clinic in football this past week, which. It truly was a basketball score. The final score was 70 to 50. And this is, this needs to be said. James Madison was up 50 to 21 at halftime. Okay. I've got the box score in front of me Uh, at the end of this game. That was shocking because North Carolina is not supposed to be losing to James Madison 70 to 50. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mac Brown, who we mentioned on our last show, literally because of the trivia question, I asked you one of the only three coaches with an FPS national championship that's still coaching says to his team that he's done. He's quitting. He's retired. Like in the, like it was such a devastating yeah. game that he's like, I can't do this anymore and everything. And then it got to the point where like someone representing him or the school had to basically say to the team, actually, no, he, he's going to be back in, in the office on Monday. He's not retiring. And I thought to myself, when the, when the loss is just so bad that it's just like, you know what, maybe I'm the problem. I, I got to get, here. so i guess hats off to jam you for for you know like smashing up north carolina in football so badly that you caused their head coach who is who is we established as a legend at that school to really consider stepping away but um wild stuff you know um thoughts any um 
Yeah, I mean, it's it it, it I don't know. It, it's 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 a bit of a like old reference, but there's a there's a it, an old Seinfeld episode to where where uh, George gets fired and he just keeps showing up to work. Yeah, <laughs> he didn't get fired. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of that thing where he's just like. You guys suck at football. I I I I, I quit, guys. I'm He's done. Like, I'll, I'll I'll see you on Sunday. <laughs> I'll see you yeah, I'll I'll see you. I'll I'll see you. I'll see you Sunday. I'll see you Monday morning. I'll be here. I mean, look, I I look, I, everybody. I actually feel bad for Mac Brown, but like, <laughs> yeah, that no, I mean, like, it's it's oh it's man, just, it's just your classic like overreaction. Um, it is a little startling to see a seventy year old do this because this is definitely like a millennial thing to do. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, that's, but, that's, there, there's probably uh, a heavier conversation to be had with what you just said, but that's kind of true. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, um, like, like now you're not going to quit. Come on. You, you wouldn't do that in the middle of the season, but uh, I, I will say that like, say they don't. And plus they were three and O going into this game. Okay. Sometimes you just have a bad day. I, I mean, well, that, that, that is also the context is that like UNC has been very good since he's been there. They've been, I think ranked in the top 10, a couple different times in the last couple of seasons, they've had, you know, playoff hopes. Um, yeah. They've had, and, they've, had a, and, they've had a slew of very overhyped quarterbacks get drafted. Yeah. Like Matt, like just whoever the UNC quarterback is expect whoever that person is to be all of a sudden round one material come like April. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it, it was definitely a thing where like they had high hopes coming into the year. And then here they go and just get annihilated at home by James I mean, Madison, which James Madison is good. I mean, they, they, yeah, they are I a mean, good team. They are a good team, you, but like both. That is race. not a team. Yeah. That yeah. is not. At home. I, I mean, like, the whoa, student section okay. was gone by halftime. I, um, yeah. Like, like that's so staggering. It's like, are we not even trying guys? Like they put 50 points at halftime is crazy. 70 by the end of the game. I will say this. If North Carolina, that's one of those losses where it's like you need to like hopefully they recover from it because I can see that derailing the season a bit. And then potentially maybe Mac Brown does actually retire at the end of the year. It's like, okay, I'm done. Like this is I I, to, I, I would yeah. imagine. I mean, I I <laughs> uh, he was retired yes. for like a decade and then he came out of retirement. It was a, and it so wasn't I would decade, imagine it was a long time. So yeah. That is the type of thing that sort of pushes you into being like, what am I doing here? Like, yeah, exactly. Um, so I, that, I can just I can retire and then go run to be a senator from Alabama. Uh, I mean, <laughs> right, exactly. So I mean, I uh, that was just that, that was just one that that caught my eye this past weekend. Uh, other than that, it really does feel like we are just kind of trudging through September, trying to get to the conference schedule, which is where all of the marquee matchups are. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, I, I will say. One of my main takeaways from the weekend is welcome to the SEC, Oklahoma. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, it is going to be exactly what we all have said for years, last couple of years, since we knew you were going to be the SEC. I'm not saying it's going to go very badly. I'm just going to say that the Tennessees of the world are going to come to Norman and do their thing because, you know, welcome to the SEC. Uh, that being said, Tennessee is really good. I think that that I think that they are a legitimately very good contender. That was the game day game, and it was a very eye opening performance there. Uh, mm -hmm. There was another one here, Michigan and USC. Similar, I have a similar kind of vibe with that one. You got USC goes all the way across the country to lose by three points, mind you, but lose to Michigan, a team that I really think has a chip on their shoulder because everyone is saying they're like like washed up. I really do not think Michigan is washed up at all. Um, I, I, I think so. The thing with Michigan is that like, I think their defense is still pretty good, but, uh, their offense is just not good. It, it it's, it, it's, it's, you know, probably somewhere between Iowa and Minnesota level offense. I don't know, but, um, I saw a pretty I, I funny, think, <laughs> I think the U USC easily could have won that game, but I think yeah. what we saw was once again, Lincoln Riley being exposed. I yeah. mean, L Lincoln Riley, I think it's now becoming apparent that he was probably Heisman. He, he's probably like a bit more of a Heisman quarterback merchant than we anticipated that he mm. was. Cause I think he's been getting a lot of credit for, I mean, cause he, I mean, he has, 
what is it, three Heisman quarterbacks now? I mean, something like, Baker, yeah, something like Tyler that. and Caleb. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that Baker, he was Tyler, given Caleb. the yep. credit for them, but I think it's maybe more so that they actually are good, were good in college. And then, <laughs> like, well, I, I, here's, here's my thing about Lincoln Riley. He's a great offensive mind. I don't know if he's necessarily the guy that you would want to be the long term solution at head coach. Um, yeah, he's definitely your OC. Your, he's your OC guy. He's a he's kind of a QB whisperer. I mean, to be completely honest, I kind of think that's how Dino ended up ultimately. Like mm-hmm. he's like he he can ride the success of his great players, but is he really your long term solution at head coach? I, and I can say that since I went to the two schools that he was a football coach at. Um, not, no knocking him or anyone else here. It's just like, huh? Like maybe they should just had our offense, had our QB room, and someone else should really be the motivator, the tactician on, well, on Saturday. I don't know. I think but... I think that's a I think that's a really good point because I think what you're seeing I let me let me back up. I, yeah. I think Lincoln Riley was actually like a really good coach in the Big Twelve and maybe to a lesser extent, but still to a pretty good extent in the Pac twelve. But when you move into the Big Ten, now you're in the Big Ten. Yeah, yeah. You you have to go like you're 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 trying to coach your players up to play, uh, you know, a, a team that has, uh, you know, a Kirk Ferentz as their coach or, um, you know, whatever the like like Big Ten level coaching is not Pac-12, Big 12 level co- like well, and also the, the it, styles are different. It's not Pac-12 or Big 12 defensive coaching. Like the deep, Correct. your mid-tier teams in the Big 10 play excellent defense. Like I mean better than you're accustomed to. Like your Minnesotas, your Northwesterns, your Illinois, you know, your not you're traditionally a mid- mid-tier Nebraska's are all better on defense than the ones that you've seen <laughs> over the over his stops. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh maybe that kind of Maybe that kind of echoes a little bit of what I just said about Oklahoma as well, since that's where, you know, Lincoln came from. Yeah. But to kind of merge the two talking points, but uh, I think this is a precursor to what we're going to see. I I just, both games were interesting, both early matchups of different teams in different conferences and, and, and the exact thing we think is going to happen happening. (laughs) Well, no, I mean, and, and that's the thing is, is, Oklahoma is, I think, what confuses me the most because, like, th- there are explanations, and, and I think that, like, what we're saying is the biggest reason or explanation as far as the way that USC is entering its its Big Ten t- um, career. But Oklahoma has had a couple seasons of warning, so they had the time to get SEC-level players. Yeah. But... And, and and their and their head coach is Brent Venables. Yeah. Former Oklahoma guy back when it was a defensive program. He he's a defensive coach. He was an incredible defensive coordinator for Clemson, but he cannot for the life of him figure out how to turn Oklahoma around. Hmm. Like he has been struggling the whole time he's been there to get them to switch into that mentality of like, you know, like punch the guy in front of you. Like get down on the ground and punch them. Trenches he, guys. Yeah. Yeah. He he cannot turn that into a, like a trenches program. Yeah. To save his life. And it's so weird. Like but, it, and, it's, and it's maybe just, being it's in the SEC will allow him to start to be able to do that because you can now recruit on that. Yeah. Uh, you can kind of build that. But we've seen Texas with Sarkeesian be able to, you know, transition that. I wanted to bring up Texas because the one really other story I wanted to I wanted to for sure talk about was the fact that um, there is no quarterback court controversy with Texas, but we did see Arch Manning make his college debut. I say in quotes because I, w- I was actually kind of worried if a Bledsoe Brady situation would happen if Quinn Ewers went down, in comes Arch Manning, and they just never look back. Sarkeesian took that out immediately and said, no, Quinn is our quarterback. When he's healthy, he's going right back in. Like, I really, really appreciated him doing that because Arch Manning will have his time. You know what I mean? But Quinn Ewers yeah. is like the reason they're back. You know what I mean? I mean, he, that dude is amazing. And and I think people are like are so excited to like get to Arch Manning. We'll get there, okay? We we know it's going to be his eventually. But I really appreciate where it's like, no, but before then, this is Quinn Ewers' time, okay? Like, he's the one in the commercials. He's the guy mm-hmm. at the head of this absolute high-powered offense we have. Uh, and I appreciate that. I just wanted to say that. Any thoughts on that? 
No, no. I mean, I think I I think that that's definitely kind of how you have to do it to to save Quinn's um, mental state. You know, because you don't want him. No, you know, sitting there, you know, kind of being like, oh, like with it with every completion or or touchdown that uh, that Arch throws, you don't want him sitting there going like, oh, am I gonna have a job? <laughs> like, you you want him to just feel safe and uh, safe and secure in his. And job he's in college. This isn't a pro right. team. Like, yeah, exactly. A ser- it's not a pro and, team. It's not. And I, I think I think that it 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 definitely like helps Arch out too because you Arch now knows. He's like, okay, well, I'm not playing for a job now, so it's just like, go out here, do my thing. Whatever happens, happens. It is win the is. game. Yeah, yeah. And so now, so now he can be like, I'm not trying to, you know, impress to win a job. I'm just doing what needs to be done to win the game. And I'm also, okay. yeah, it it is helpful because we saw him come in a little bit last year, I think, for a a, a little bit. I think so. And then, so now he's coming in this year, um, for a little bit. And so these these little these little experiences I think are helpful to where he can see what he like, where he's at. And he knows. So then when Quinn comes back, he can go back into the, into the lab, figure out what maybe he's uncomfortable with and needs to work on heading into next season. Cause it will be his team next year. Yeah. I like mean, that, and so he needs to, he can figure out, okay, you know, this coverage, I think definitely confused me. So I'm gonna have to work and study hard on, you know, how, on how to beat this one mm-hmm. and stuff like that. This, um, and let's It'll be real. Only make I mean, him better. He's exactly. He, he's cut from the Manning block. He wants to stay at a place for like four years, you know, and and develop. And and, and you know that's and it, he's able to do that. He will be a good example for those who are like, hey, pick a school and stay there, even if you hit uh, adversity. I will say that he's a backup quarterback. If they were playing like Georgia, as they do in like a few weeks, and that happened, I would be worried. I'd be like, yeah, he's Arch Manning, but he's like our second string guy, like. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want to. I, I we I we really need you. We really need Quinn for this. I'd rather have the guy who's experienced. You know, so um, so yeah. I mean, let's call him what he is. He's the backup. So, uh, yeah, maybe next year. You know, but uh, when you're playing UTSA yeah. and UL Monroe, these are good games to, for your your guy not to be 100 percent right. So no, yeah, I safe, mean, safe games. I, I think yeah. That- I think it definitely, I mean, well, even just kind of going to what you were, what you said, I, I do at least respect Arch enough for picking a school like Texas to where he knew when he committed, he wasn't going to be playing for two years, three years. Like he was like, all right, well, I'm not going to be quarterback one as a freshman. Like, so he, he knew where to go to develop, to learn for actually the better, better betterment of his career. There's a... he probably he probably <laughs> could have walked into Tennessee, maybe even Ole Miss, and just been starter immediately. Just, they would have been like, "Okay, you're yeah. just gonna be the guy for the next four years." <laughs> yeah, or 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 I mean, even if he wanted to even dominate, he's he's from New Orleans, so he could have gone to like Tulane and just oh, absolutely man. wrecked it. Um, <laughs> I mean, he could have been like a god down there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but but, but I, again, like you know, he's got the but you know the, the Mannings know. But like any good family, they like yeah, his last name is Manning. But this is his story. He's the one. Go to Texas. Don't go to your own school. You know that's what mm-hmm. that's what Peyton did. He went to Tennessee. He wasn't going to go to Ole Miss. Eli went to Ole Miss. That's fine. You know, like his dad. So um, this is this is this is a this is I still think a very cool story. Yeah, and I'd like to I'd like to just see it go, but. Um, get well soon, Quinn Ewers. This is still your squad, and I, for one, want to see your college career fully end with it being your time. Then we'll get Arch Manning at Texas. We'll see what that's like. Um, any more college stories, Casey, before we switch to NFL? Uh, yes, I did mm-hmm. have, I think, one more. I am um, all ears and thoughts. I, I, I did just, just want to at least uh, cover Bowling Green. Um mm-hmm. That we we talked about at the last uh, the last show, uh, Bowling Green also competed very heavily with Texas A&M. Um, yeah, they lost. They by went six. on the they went, went on the road, lost by a, a, a touchdown or, or lost within a score to Penn State, and they went they they had a break and they went on the road again to to Kyle Field and almost won again there. So a, a huge like I- impressive showing out because these were two two teams that we you know we thought probably coming into the season we get you know killed by 30 or 40 or whatever 50 even sure um but putting on some pretty impressive fight 
uh, on the in some hostile environments, I think was impressive. And hopefully that means good things for conference play. So, I, don't know. I can also say that kind of through the grapevine, literally uh, over the course of this week, in, in just in my circles in the MAC, that some folks at Texas a and were quoted as saying that the most legit team, it felt like the most complete football team we've played so far this year was Bowling Green. Texas A&M also played Notre Dame. So yeah. keep that in mind. <laughs> okay. Notre Dame, who lost to a MAC team, <laughs> which we discussed last show. So my point in saying that, you know, especially now that I have a, a different dog in the fight in the MAC as well, and talking about Bowling Green and other schools, the MAC has had a really good non-conference showing, like really good. I, mm-hmm. I, I mean, obviously you get the one upset with NIU, but you everyone's played every, every, like the, you're, when the top of well, that to, conference is Toledo playing each other well really as, well. Toledo did beat Mississippi State. Exactly. You're gonna, I was going to acknowledge it. Toledo destroys Mississippi State, and it's like, okay, so, you know, fly the flag. You know, the MAC pirate flag yeah. they have, which is awesome. Uh, the Pirates fan in me appreciates appreciates that a lot. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, I, I never sleep on the Mid-American Conference. We always say that uh, in anything, and really in any sport. But uh, the football season is always really interesting because it's like I, I really think I, – I, I, I'm, I'm liking that pick of, 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 of our friend Matt bg to win the mac more and more with each passing week <laughs> that's looking yeah, good yeah I, i'm seeing the, who's gonna be at the end i i will say um the the biggest winner of that game i think is a is a certain number zero for the the falcons uh harold fan and junior the number one tight end in the country uh <laughs> yeah uh i mean it, it very i don't know i mean i think him having huge performances against two power conference teams is just he's he's flying up the draft boards i would imagine um so that'll be very interesting to see we'll be very interested to see where he goes so acknowledging that is it time to shift to the nfl yeah yeah we, we can get into that <laughs> so we're in the three game we're at the three game mark and this is always really interesting because you start to see the good becoming the good the bad is definitely bad and there's always surprises but I really think the difference in coaching I've seen so far has been the biggest like difference so far this this year. I want to go ahead and acknowledge something right out of the gate because it's been a bit of a theme on our show. Case, and we have to talk about how the best team in the NFL right now looks like the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> and it's like not really close. <laughs> I, I, Josh Allen is your yeah. MVP, at least as of week three. Josh Allen is your MVP. He's dropping every single touchdown on planet Earth. They are amazing. Their their offense is incredible. Um, addition by subtra- subtraction, apparently, with the guys they've gotten rid of. We're, we're the most close to this game. That was on Monday night where they won 47 to 10 over the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, these dudes are rolling. They're circling them wagons. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... <sighs> I, I think they definitely probably must have done a lot of soul searching in the off season to figure out how to um, fix it. I, they, they had a lot of issues on defense last year. And I think that they've managed to get together and address that. Uh, we, we saw DeMar Hamlin with an interception. Yeah. Very interesting. I, I, I saw somebody say, I think I know where this is going. I, I saw somebody say on Twitter that Trevor Lawrence is now the first quarterback in NFL history to throw an interception to someone who's died. Someone who has died and come back to life. Yes, absolutely. That is definitely what has <laughs> so, happened. I um, mean, absolutely bananas reaction to that online. But um, yeah, I mean, look, I I will stand by what I said. I mean, the window is closed, but he, they're <laughs> they're looking impressive for now. Uh, we'll see what that looks like in January. Right. It's three, it's three weeks into the season and they've played the Cardinals, the Dolphins and the Jaguars, Cardinals and Jaguars, Jaguars who might actually be very bad. Um, yeah. yeah, Trevor Lawrence, that's the opposite of this situation. Trevor Lawrence might not be good. I just want to throw it out there. It's time to have that conversation because it's not looking good for him. Insert the um, Charles Barkley. It's time to start a dialogue. <laughs> it's, it's time to start a dialogue. Uh, but I saw a few people saying that just because he made some really boneheaded plays. And I'm like, um, he's regressing. This ain't looking good. And they're looking really bad. No, like, I mean, I, I so. said that. Yeah. 
I, I said that uh, last year. I mean, I, I saw. I think you did. Yeah. I, I, I saw them play the Browns in Cleveland. And, and I was like, this team is not good. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, they, like, like he was, he kind of like came, they, they kind of came back a little bit at the end, but like he was flustered. He was, you know, not throwing, he was not throwing accurately. It was, it was weird. Um, hey, so we'll see. Uh, and I'm back to the bills real quick. And, and that was what uh, a Miami Dolphins team that w- didn't have Tua for like half the game. Yeah. More yeah. so. I, again, um, and and having to rely again uh, on other other QBs and Skyler. So, I I, I think we'll, we'll see three games into the they year. they they go to Baltimore on Sunday. So mm-hmm. we'll we'll know more about that. Which the Ravens are also one and or one and two. So we'll, we'll probably learn a lot more. We'll learn a lot about both of them. Um, you know what but... team? You know what team is three and zero, Kaysen? Do you know what team is three and zero? Uh, I, 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 the, the Minnesota Vikings. Yes. Sam, we will Sam get, Darnold, Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> we will get to them, but this, this wonderful banner that's behind me that my new setup now has me blocking a bit. I'll lean a little bit over here and the, and my hat, the Pittsburgh Steelers are three and O now it, they are the, they are the ugliest football three and O team I have ever seen. They, they cannot score touchdowns, but, um, their defense is the Pittsburgh Steelers defense right now is on track for like, like single season records. Like this is actually kind of crazy how good the defense is right now. And if that, and, and if, you know, half decent QB play from Justin Fields, obviously you ride the hot quarterback right now. If this isn't Pittsburgh Steeler football, I don't know what is. I don't know if I've ever seen it in my life. We can't score a touchdown. It looks really tough, but you know, we, we are going to play the Colts this Sunday and right now it looks like that game could end 17 nothing Steelers with like no touchdowns. <laughs> I guess one touchdown. You get one, one defensive touchdown. Um it's kind of crazy. I don't necessarily see this sustaining, but the cuz the offense just cannot score to save their life, but if you get continuously half decent offensive play and you have a defense that literally no one can score on, barring everyone's healthy, Steelers will be there at the end. Like always, and not to mention, our division yeah. is terrible, Kaysen. Yeah, yeah. AFC I North mean, might just be bad outside of Pittsburgh. Yeah, I, I mean the 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 Steelers are are the are Iowa in the NFL. Yep, um, pretty much. We we uh, sure are. But, and when the Browns, I, mean, uh, I I do think another one of our predictions is coming true though, Kaysen. The Bengals are flat out bad. Uh, and yeah, flat and out bad. The, and the Super Bowl year was a fluke. I don't think that's, you know, for for all my family members that are Bengals fans, I have been saying since that year the Super Bowl year was a fluke. I don't think the nucleus is there. I here's the thing though, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, not necessarily like it's you know working out for him and his new location, but I do think that the that people severely underestimated how badly the Bengals would miss Brian Callahan. Mm. Um, that I, I know the Titans are, are not good, but the roster is not good either. Uh, but yeah, Zach Taylor, I don't think is a good coach. <laughs> I think it's abundantly clear. No. And, and, and you, was it you who joked? It's going to be wild to see Zach Taylor get, get fired on hard knocks. Like, that yeah, could, yeah, that could I actually mean, happen. <laughs> it, if he even makes it to that section if, of the season. Yeah, if we even get that far. I mean, I this is setting up quite a, a, a way crazy thing with hard knocks. Now, I as far as the Steelers go, the back end of the entire AFC North schedules is just insane. I'm not expecting this to necessarily continue, but the Steelers usually don't do this. A hot start doesn't happen. Usually the weather gets cold and then the Steelers rattle off like seven straight wins to make the playoffs. So we'll see what happens. I wanted to also shift to another story that I find very interesting. Again, the opposite of that Bengal situation. I don't know if it's coaching. I don't necessarily know what the circumstances are. But, Kaysen, do you remember a year ago when I said I can't even tell the Bears to tank for Caleb? Do you think Caleb can fix this mess? Do you remember when I said that on this podcast? Because I remember saying that on this podcast. Look, I mean, Jaden Daniels looks great with the Washington Commanders. And they are not a great franchise historically, at least not in our life lifetime. Yeah. Um, and the Bears don't have an offensive line. Uh, they, they've generated one of my favorite memes of the season so far when they're doing a shotgun run and the entire line is on the ground, having just gotten destroyed by the 
defensive line of the Colts, which is one of my favorite funniest images I've ever seen. I, if you're a fan, I apologize, but um, even the fans have got to admit, yeah, that's kind of amazing. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say that I think the Bears picked the worst QB because I don't think that's what's going. Again, just coaching. Coaching. Thoughts on any of that? No, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, I think a lot of people were a little stunned at 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 the outcome of the, the commander's season so far. I mean, they uh, they kind of they, – they, first game they lost – pretty handily to the buck to the Buccaneers, but then yep. they beat a bad Giants team and also a, probably a bad Bengals team. But I mean, they are having a lot of offensive uh, output. Um, and Jaden Daniels is, is uh, relatively, I guess you could say safe um, and re- accurate with the ball. I mean, he, yeah. he, I don't think he hasn't done a pick yet. Um, he's, got uh a 67.9 qbr which is the seventh in the league uh i think he, he has what, uh an 80 percent completion percentage which is there you go insane um but yeah i mean i i i kind of thought going in that he probably could have ended up being the best quarterback in this class mm. i mean he he did win the heisman he did. um so, did so i well <laughs> I uh, there yeah. there that well, Aha. Uh, <laughs> that year was to be right disputed. right yeah mm-hmm. um anyway yeah so I I think that it it it's also I think a sort of a mentality thing too I mean we've seen there was a lot of discourse about this particular moment but the the Bears played the Texans the the Texans beat the Bears. And like CJ Stroud, like went to go talk to Caleb and Caleb, like basically brushed him off and like, didn't even want to have a conversation with him. Uh Oh, I mean, obviously that moment kind of looks different now after CJ hasn't looked great since that game, but CJ uh, or Caleb. See, well, CJ, CJ hasn't either. That's true. Yeah. But the, but in a vacuum, it was interesting though, to see, you know, the, the, the reigning rookie of the year coming up to a a rookie and, you know, offering some advice and him seemingly not being interested in it in a vacuum. That is an interesting (laughs) visual. I agree. Now I want to shift back to another three and O team. That's just, we got to talk about this. If the season ended right now, Mike O'Connell is your coach of the year in, in Minnesota, those guys, Kevin, Kevin, excuse me. I said, Mike O'Connell, Kevin O'Connell, my bad, is your coach of the year. And, you know, I, I it's one thing. They win the first game 28-6 to six over the Giants. It's like, okay, doing that situation. Uh, they beat the 49ers 23-17 to 17 in a pretty impressive mm-hmm. situation. Hey, you know, they were the reigning NFC champions. And then they destroy the Houston Texans, who, you know, again, transitional since you just mentioned CJ. Uh, and it's all with Sam Darnold. I mean, thoughts? Is that sustainable? Yeah, I, is that I, a I, think, I think the I Vikings think, are good. I think, I think your brain was mixing up Mike Zimmer and, and Kevin O'Connell. Yeah, I it was. You said that. Okay, I but did say, yeah. yep, you're right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, well, I think on the surface, probably Sam Donald's a better quarterback than J.J. J. McCarthy, so that's the first thing. Um, Mechanical, and, but, and knows the NFL, too. Yeah. Like, um, you, you could argue that if, they, if this was McCarthy, who knows how, I think you know. this is probably – uh just maybe like like he this isn't so much a knock on on the 49ers but i think this is probably the best fit sam darnold has ever had i mean you i mean you've got justin jefferson you've got a a pretty solid line um and what i I, uh aaron jones is there now right so the they've got um a pretty a pretty solid team around him yeah and so i they're not asking him to do much i mean And so I think when you compare that with the places he has been previously, it's a very good situation. The system I think is probably beneficial to him. And I do think Kevin O'Connell is a fairly good coach. I mean, we've seen, we saw, we saw what he was able to do with Kirk. Um, And so I, I, I think it could work out. I mean, Sam Donald basically is Kirk. And so it's, 
it, it, it's just you know i mean kirk cousins on you know the the 2019 jets probably would have been the same type of thing i mean it's uh if you have a bad team doesn't matter i mean you can only do so much yes but, and uh so that was that was really what i had i did want to hear your take on the uh stat that i sent you today from adam schefter and i sent that adam schefter today wednesday put out a pretty amazing uh stat which was the last team to start zero and three to make the playoffs uh Kaysen, uh who was it <laughs> i sent it to you yeah i uh i i don't really want to yeah i'm going to talk about this the 2018 houston texans who were quarterbacked by deshaun watson are the last zero and three team to make the playoffs that's pretty wild. Uh, now, 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 am I saying the Browns are going to make the playoffs? Absolutely not. But what I am saying is that that's kind of an amazing stat. Uh, but that stat is also from what six years ago. So, uh, yeah, eh, you know, that's that's not what things are going on now. I think, yeah, I think that was. Did they just go and then get smacked in the wild card round? I'm trying pretty to think sure. Of, yeah, what that like, game was. They were that. they were kind of one of those. They were like the team that like shouldn't have been there, kind of thing. Yeah, because they. They were like average and missed the playoffs his rookie year, and then they kind of snuck in at the end mm-hmm. his second year. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I mean, I I don't really uh, have any pertinent thoughts regarding that particular <laughs> individual. I know, um, I know. And, and and that being said, I, I guess uh, just what 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 is your take on the in the NFL season so far? I mean, we're three weeks in, but uh, I I kind of gave you my arc overarching thoughts. Uh, is there um, anything beyond go Chiefs that you want to say? Yeah, because I'm going to put yeah. that down on the show every single. Yeah, week. no, I mean, I, <laughs> I I it was a bit of a stressful game for for my Chiefs um, down there in Atlanta. <laughs> um, the it, but it, it it it's there's a there's a lot of discourse surrounding the production level of my guy Travis, uh. But I I think you know all in all it, you're you're getting the other teammates in opportunity, uh. You're getting Xavier involved. You're getting Rasheed involved. Um. And Travis is you know doing his best blocking. Uh. So also I I my one last positive take that I do want to just throw out there because they were such a punchline in recent years. The NFC South is flat out good. Minus the Panthers, like the Saints are good. Buccaneers, Baker's Buccaneers are rolling are rolling well too. Uh there's a, there's a really big matchup between the Saints and Falcons this Sunday. Uh because the Falcons are I think decent. And, you know, they they beat the Eagles. They arguably should have beat the Chiefs. Uh and then you know, Panthers won a game at least this past year, so obviously they're the basement of the division. Not really basing that. But um, I think that's a much more competitive division than people give it credit for. And it's just one of those things where it's like, hey, real recognize real. Those teams are off to good starts. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I get what you're saying, but it is just kind of funny in the context that what you just said, all three of those teams lost and the Panthers won. Yes. So it is it is just it is on the surface very funny. There is something to be said, though. I mean, we Bryce Young got benched, and clearly a move that came from David Tepper, um, because I I don't think their new coach Dave Canales would have made that decision see, I, unless see, it came I, from ownership. Yeah, I I I'm not convinced that that's necessarily coming directly from Tepper. I think it's I think it might have been a co- head coaching move. It's like, hey, make the make the I can see definitely it being the other way around, saying look checking it with ownership first and him saying yeah that's fine like well right right we're not good like yeah either way that that was a move that had to have been signed off on by david exactly exactly the the brand new head coach doesn't come in and bench the former first overall pick exactly and i think i think we are also as a society so eager to declare busts i mean even goes back to that trevor lawrence brief convo we had earlier it's like I feel I feel a bit for Bryce Young because I, he arguably should never have been in that situation, especially you get, you get CJ in there. Who's to say yeah. CJ would have done any better with that organization the last couple of years? I think CJ's more mechanically and bigger and better for the NFL. Right. Like, I, I I think his body frame indicates he would have done better. But right. I think Bryce yeah, it, is a bit small. It, no, for the look. League. I mean, yeah. 
the the problems with Bryce, or at least a lot of the problems with Bryce, mm-hmm. have nothing to do with Bryce as a person. No, they're just it's just structurally as a human being, he is not designed to be an NFL quarterback at his size. No. That sucks. But like that's just the that's just the case. That's just the fact. It's like, it's quite frankly just the sport. I mean, I don't know. What it, to tell it, you. Like, like he <laughs> yeah. is now like he is now officially like the floor of height and size you can be drafted at, and like there is no one anywhere near that size that can. I mean, and he and he himself brought that floor down. Like when he yeah. was drafted, like he really should not. Yeah, because I that think situation. the smallest before that was Russ. Um, and even that was a huge debate at the time because he, I mean, that oh, was yeah. I think, most of the reason he slipped to the third. Um, yeah. but and yeah, even when I, he was drafted, that was controversial. People yeah. were like, Why are they, even a third round pick? Why are they picking Russell Wilson like the Seahawks? I, you know, so can you, yeah, I mean, I, just, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, there, there is a universe to where maybe he's he, he succeeds, um, in be, behind of a, a lot better of a line. Yeah, but yeah, that that bad of a roster was not ever going to help him succeed, right? And um, then, but I I think he's going to get beat up in the league. Yeah, w- yeah, regardless of where he is come in the in the coming years, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, so I I, I will say it was very interesting though, to see him get benched, Andy Dalton come in and immediately just destroy. <laughs> like, man, the red rifle. Okay, he still, ha- he still has it, man. <laughs> that, that's uh, his one game a year in which you're like. One, oh, there he Andy is. <laughs> but can't you see Andy? Can't you see Dalton being like the the next Flacco? Like, can't you see the Flacco situation happening to yeah. him in like two years? Like, yeah. some teams just left for dead, and then in comes Red. Whether heck, well, maybe it's there. Like, he comes and, in, and it's Andy like, Dalton, oh snap! Andy Dalton is is now like the current league's Ryan Fitzpatrick. Like, yeah, is the, the the perennial journey? Like, former starter, former starter, perennial journeyman. Who's like good for a handful of really good games every mm-hmm. year, and like, then he ends up, and then he turns into a pumpkin, and then you're like, oh, right. Okay, and right. I even look at the Steelers in years where they've had a backup QB. Like I would pick a guy like him as my backup ten times out of ten. Like our guy goes down. Like the years we had Ben or a franchise QB. Okay, Ben's gonna be out for like a couple of weeks. That's what Charlie Batch was. Th- throw in Charlie Batch, the 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 legend in Pittsburgh because he was like the best backup ever. Like he went in there, he had situations where he had to pay play like portions of seasons and he was good that was the thing like charlie batch was like good he was and he was fine being an nfl backup because most of the time it's great but the thing is when he actually had to go out there he had a winning record that's what was crazy so yeah. um so i don't know i think there's something to be said where it's like hey we need the journeyman guy get dalton in here i would be like look we'll take him for a game um and guys like that came and went with the Steelers. Michael Vick was a Steeler. People forget about that. Michael Vick spent the st- season as a Steeler and won like a couple of games. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, it's stuff like that. So I just, I like stories like that. So way to get it done. Andy Dalton, you got the Panthers their first win. Of the yeah. Season. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think <laughs> um, basically just, just where, where I'm at. Uh, yeah. Quinn, you were, it's time to start apartment shopping in Charlotte. So uh, well, well, I mean, we'll see, man. They're, they are not an 0 3 team that I think could stay there. Um, I mean, I, you know, maybe Cincinnati's looking like that too. <laughs> but, they wouldn't, but obviously, they just pay Burrow. That's not realistic. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, Jacksonville? <laughs> no, uh, Jacksonville. I'm saying, like, it's Ten- I, it, Tennessee. I mean, they, they uh, have Levis, but I mean, they're not super over committed to Levis because he was a second. Exactly. Runner, so. I'm just saying I, like, yeah. week, week three to four to five is when you start to see who's actually good and who's actually not giants. Good. Maybe giants, giants, New York. Maybe. Yeah, I could see that. So let's see who's, uh, who's going to be uh, the basement here in the next one. We're entering kind of the second hour and obviously this is, you know, I don't know how long the show is going to be now, but um, is it time to get into some pop culture stuff? Jason? Sure. Yeah, let's get into it. <clears throat> so we are going to discuss some Marvel stuff. I, I did say to case and well, actually I'll, I'll wait to bring that up when I do that. I'll, so I don't forget it. I did have the conversation with you case of like, all right, so what are you watching the penguin this fall? Or are you watching Agatha all along? Well, obviously we are more of a Marvel podcast, so I'm watching Agatha all along, but like the penguin apparently does look cool that I might have to binge it at some point, but We'll see. Man, that's the perfect thing to binge before uh, Hard Knocks later this year. Yeah. I mean, honestly. But um, before we get into Agatha all along, uh, the Thunderbolts trailer did come out. 
And it gave yeah. me definitely that feel of like, okay, like we really are getting into the nitty gritty Marvel stories again, because next year is pretty loaded year. I mean, this year we knew it was going to be pretty light, but next year you already, you're going to have brave new world, which is going to involve setup of, you know, Thunderbolt Ross and whatever we're getting the Thunderbolts in May. So that one's in February one's in May. Uh, the fun, the, the trailer was pretty fun. It definitely looked yep. like your, your hodgepodge of, marvel's suicide squad-esque like villains you know uh come together villains are pseudo anti-heroes uh rough around the edges group comes together the interesting thing about that is though back when those suicide squad movies were going on like they all kept comparing those to guardians movies and the you know the first suicide squad was famously reshot significantly to be more humorous and was still not very good <laughs> and then of course um James Gunn put together and wrote and directed the incredibly underrated The Suicide Squad, one of the a fantastic movie that I swear no one has seen but me. But um, that being said, uh, thoughts on the trailer, Kason? I literally only watched it like once or twice. So yeah, I I think I I did. Uh, I think I I saw it when it leaked at Comic Con, but uh, I think I think that would end up being the same trailer they showed there. But yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it looks like everything that I was hoping from it. Uh, I mean, the you've got a lot of fun, uh, dynamic there the, with with, uh, Florence Pugh and David Harbor reprising their roles. That dynamic was really fun. <laughs> uh, Th- theirs is honestly which, their relationship is honestly gonna. At least I mean, carry the, that the, group at the first, moment when she's like, fun. when she's like, I just don't know what I'm doing, and he's like. Yeah, I can relate. I've I've got projects lined up. I'm very busy. <laughs> very busy. <laughs> I, I I love the whole beginning of the trailer. I, I will report to you to a to a DoorDash HQ. <laughs> and it's just like, oh snap! I gotta like look like I'm put together. Um, there and honestly, I gotta. It, it is it is funny to me with David Harbour because like he he's dealt in Stranger Things. Spoiler alert for Stranger Things, but having to deal with a Russian in that one, and then he is a Russian in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's just it's just funny that uh dynamic but um florence Pugh, who just does very good accents uh mm-hmm. she she's even joked that like she has a weirdly deep voice for like a for like a british woman so like, yeah he's like she's joked about that before but i'm like well no it's perfect for like your russian she's she's very well casted in this i'm happy that she's like the lead of this movie um yeah yeah i mean i i think definitely she is exactly who i would picture would be the lead of that group absolutely um she's got a bit of a because, rough time yeah. as a character too yeah uh, i also really really we didn't even really talk about this the fact that the first like marketing for the movie was literally her walking out of her trailer in costume and she was just walking with her phone on like like she just flipped on her um video if you know what i'm talking about it was like months yeah. ago. yeah like and it's like hey i've been told i can like you know show some stuff from set so she's just walking around and it's like Oh, look at that. Let's say hi to this. I mean, the whole video yeah. was probably like a couple of minutes, but it was like, oh, that's cool. So they, they really are. So this is like going to be her and David's at least team to start. And then it'll open up for some, uh, some standouts to be in this. Obviously Bucky's in there, uh, winter soldier. Yeah. But you got some other characters in there that you just didn't see, you know, like that, like uh taskmaster's back. And then you got uh ghost from, um, what you call it? The Ant Man, the second Ant Man. Yeah, yeah, Ant Man and the Wasp. Um, yeah, Ant Man and the Wasp. And so. then U.S. Agent. Um, yep. The uh, I mean, I, I, I Russell Sun is back. <laughs> yeah, Wyatt. Wyatt Russell. Wyatt I, Russell. I mean, I, I, I like. I mean, I think he plays that character well. Uh, Me too. He, he does a good job of of playing sort of the um compl- complicated persona that that is um what what is it. I'm trying to remember the, the guy's name. John Walker. Uh, John Walker. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I got IMDb um, open in front of me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I I thought that it was. I I did like. I mean, I did. I I I'd liked. You know, we we talked about the time, but I liked. You know, Falcon Winter Soldier. Yeah, um, me too. Dude, which I uh, which I affectionately called that show Sam and Bucky, because yeah. that's because that's the show. It's Sam and Bucky, literally. I I I am very <laughs> curious to see because like we we know how that ended, so yeah. I am very curious to see uh on if that sort of plays into how the the um uh plot twist at the end of that show with with the reveal of uh uh, peggy carter's niece being like peggy Peggy carter's niece yeah yeah i i I, 
because we, we do see right um that it's probably going to lean in that in that direction but i'm, I'm curious on if she's going to be well, well the one thing that i find interesting about this is that thunderbolts and brave new world captain america brave new world are very close to each other and i would imagine because of the characters that cross between this area of the mcu the, the stuff in brave new world is going to directly affect the thunderbolts right I it yeah, would have, it would have I would to. think so. Yeah. Like so because the one thing I can't really gauge from the trailer is okay, I see they're being brought together. Is this obviously it's being brought they're being brought together by thing. Who is the, who are they going up against? Like what's the what's the threat? And my thoughts are is the threat going to be like carried over from Brave New World? Is this probably some sort of oh snap, th- like cap may not be enough for this. We need another team or whatever. Like, yeah, because it, 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 it is yeah, it, it is sort of a thing that we've seen before, where mm-hmm. they're where they're all lured to a place under different reasons. Like they're all contracted to go to a certain location, and then they're all essentially supposed to be killed at that one location, right? And wiped out. And then so I th- I would imagine the movie the movie is going to center around them trying to figure out who tried to have them all killed. And right. then, and, and that's probably a mystery. They're going to be trying to figure that out. And, and 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 I would agree that the the most obvious answer is it's going to come from the events of Brave New World. That, that right. makes the most sense. I also find it interesting. I haven't watched any breakdowns on it, but the fact that it's called Thunderbolts asterisk is a little interesting to me. That I, I, like that's definitely. I, I think the leading theory is that the actual movie is going to be Dark Avengers. Like that the title is going to be Dark Avengers. Oh, um, okay. Like it's going to, it's going to say like Thunderbolts, like, like the, probably the final credits are going to be Thunderbolt. Like it's going to show Thunderbolts asterisk and then it's going to be wiped out. And it's going to be like Dark Avengers or something. Um, interesting. Interesting. But, I can see that. So what, like this is the initial team up as the yeah. Thunderbolts and then it's like Dark. Aven- okay. That's very, very interesting. And that would be very cool. The MCU has never done that before where they've really, led a whole movie in and it's actually a real title um yeah the cl- i guess the closest thing we saw was was cat was um falcon and the winter soldier where they flipped the end and it was like yeah captain america and the winter soldier which yeah I th- like me i uh, i said well, why wouldn't this be captain america and the white wolf because that's really what more bucky is now you know what i mean yeah but they didn't do that so um Maybe it's to set kind of that up here. He's still kind of known as the as the you know Winter Soldier in this story. So uh, I'm excited. It looks cool. It's just it's yet another Marvel team up. Let's be real. No one does it better than them. I mean, they've even got a team up essentially that they're setting up in Agatha. <laughs> so it's like you know what? Why not? And, you know uh, the group, but the buddy group things all seem to be cool. But the other yeah. thing, the other thing I will say about this is not everyone in this group has superpowers. And it's just very interesting to see the human esque level characters, um, you know, roll at an Avengers level. I think that's the other thing about the Suicide Squad type stories I always really liked, and from comics and stuff. So, um, yeah, solid trailers. Very excited for next year this this sect of the MCU because uh, we're heading in a direction. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything I else? Agree uh no i mean we, we yeah we can get into agatha um, we're gonna get into agatha all along yeah we then the the series that's that's out on disney plus now two to three in, episodes in by the time that you see this case and i are only going to be discussing the first two because that's what was released last week uh spoiler alert honestly that's why we usually do this yeah. at the end of the show we're just going to talk about the spoilers in an open way uh you're more than welcome to listen uh it is a mini series and that's kind of where i want to begin the discussion uh case and i watched these first two episodes yeah i was generally intrigued my my immediate first thought as the credits rolled on the second episode were and i have them written down here this show has its work cut out for it and when i when what i mean by that is this is the this is the first time that we are now like we're we're quite a few years into the marvel shows now right i think it's they're up Mm -hmm. to like 11 tv projects um if you count everything, including like the mini, the movies, you know, something like that. And this is the first time that we are following a protagonist where everything about them was established in another show. Agatha wasn't in a movie. No, she wasn't even referenced prior to WandaVision. You know, we were even speculating whether or not we were, we even were getting her as a character, but, and I don't really count echo because even though she was in another show, like it required like, 
like like Hawkeye and others required knowledge of Kingpin from like the Daredevil show and other stuff. Yeah. But like literally everything about Agatha we know came from another TV show. It didn't come from a movie, anything like that. So my immediate first thought when I saw the trailer for it was, okay, it looks cool as a horror project, but as a pseudo horror project, it's not a horror series. It's not really. Uh, it's more of a thriller series, I'd say. Mm. Um, do people care enough about about Agatha as a character, especially when you also consider that there's not a whole lot of star power in this show. Arguably the biggest show star in the series is Aubrey Plaza. She was one of the biggest selling points of it. And she's not the protagonist uh, who is a uh, uh, Ka- Catherine Hahn. Right. So mm-hmm. th- I, that it, all of that together was this show has its work cut out for it, even as a mini series. Um, and nothing in the first two episodes really made me think that that was not the case. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I definitely agree. I mean, it's it's yeah. definitely it, it it's definitely giving off the the impressions of you have to like like this is for the diehards that watch everything. Like, if you're not, then like you're gonna have no interest in the show. There, there's uh, no reason to watch this, arguably. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't seen the and, and so on division and everything, definitely else. interesting. I mean, yeah, like. It, I, I, so I will say, yeah, as I was watching the first episode and as the first episode ended, I, my whole thought process was what the, like, what is going on? Like, I, 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 I could not follow what was happening. I was like, this is very strange and odd to me. Um, Half the episode yeah. is like a detective show and yeah like and and i and i even thought to myself okay well we know where agatha was left by wanda still under some sort of spell what i thought was really really bizarre creative choice was they they did that kind of fake intro again that they did with wandavision where they did Mm -hmm. like a tv show intro they did like that intro again of like that kind of series and i'm like okay that's clearly like a fake out but I feel like that only really works if you're going to do that through the whole thing. And then by the second episode, we were we were to just the regular show again. I'm like, well, that's kind of pointless if she's just going to break the spell in the first episode. And I thought, are we in for a situation where she doesn't break the spell until like halfway through the series? Because quite literally, you already did that with WandaVision. You've already done this concept. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I think... But that's not what happened, you know? I think... I don't know. I mean, so... To, to to preface mm-hmm. the the show is also created by and the showrunner is Jack Schaefer who create who she created WandaVision and so it's all going to be pretty identical it, it seems to be operating the same way yep um sort of with with kind of similar tropes and styles and things like that and so it is interesting i mean i do think the first the first episode in particular i think mirrored a lot of the first two episodes of WandaVision like you remember when it was in the fifties type of stuff and that, so that was, I think where they were going to where well, the most, first... most every episode, yeah. because remember they were parodying a different sitcom per, yeah. per decade. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the, the first two in particular before she started seeing like cracks in it and stuff. But, oh yeah. Um, the first two episodes of WandaVision, which are awful in retrospect of the entire series. <laughs> like the fact that all of the Marvel TV show projects for Disney plus started with the first two episodes of WandaVision is just wild. <laughs> like a while, a while. I'm like, we really must have been coming out of the pandemic because, like, I cannot. I like look back on those. I'm like, you could not pay me to watch those two episodes again. But anyway, <laughs> like, yeah, you could probably pay me to do it. But anyway, yeah. Continue. Um. But anyway, so yeah, it, it definitely weird. Um. I I will say. It it it, it kind of made up like the first part of the episode kind of made up for. Uh, or it was made up for at the end because it was a really interesting um, interaction between Agatha and Aubrey Plaza's character. Uh, Rio. Rio. Yep. It, like, like their dynamic was very interesting. And I, like that to me in and of itself was the pull for me. It's just like, okay, I'm I'm really curious as far as who this person is. And right. like where their backstory is, how they come into play, because like they were like they, they made the comment that Agatha can't steal her power because it would kill her. Why? I, yeah. I'm intrigued to know why. There's like, a lot of how, weird how, things there. Like, how do you know each other from the past? And, and 
why like why do you hate each other like where is this coming from when also um, they established that agatha does go back all the way to salem which which yeah um, a lot of the witches in this series apparently do and i'm wondering okay is aubrey plaza that old like along with... i i would have yeah i would imagine she goes yeah to like these yeah. two clearly have a history um yeah and and there's something going on there uh she was in the first one she wasn't really in the second one uh episode we're still in the first one though yeah 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 and so i don't know i mean i, I thought it was interesting i thought that it was unsettling at times <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think uh, i think this setup also of this of this kid the teen right now we don't know his name because whenever he goes to say his name they have the effect of the you know some sort of yeah thing on his mouth or whatever but then they have a scene in the second episode that i will just kind of talk about because agatha seems to wonder what is up with this kid and but like needs to bring him along because he, he wants to go on this witch's road he's the first person we hear mention it and it's like okay well to go on the road we need a multiple witches so i mean like like let's go get some yeah and but what well, what i get this dynamic of i bet this guy is like some sort of huge potentially mad huge being that's like in disguise like is this how we're getting mephisto like immediately in my head like was like like or that level of a thing where agatha doesn't know what's up but he yeah but she does know that something's up like he's not he's like some sort of other deity in this teen's body i'm not convinced that he's like a real what we're seeing he's just he, you're telling me he just he knows so much about the road and all of this stuff in ancient lore and he's just a 16 year old no way like well i think the, I, I mean i took the insinuation as that like he's also magic okay yeah. um but just a, a young one um but and yes. also mo if you she says if you're powerful enough to break the spell on me well then you must i should probably bring you along and i'm like that seems pretty significant because even she is like, yeah, but that was a that was a that was a Scarlet Witch spell. Like, yeah, that's yeah. supposed to be like impossible to break. <laughs> so, so yes, you know. and I I agree with you. Yeah, that like, it, it, going back to WandaVision, it was like, oh, X Y and Z is Mephisto. This is Mephisto. This is Mephisto. Right. Um, you know. I mean, and so it, yeah, like like it would be objectively hilarious. <laughs> For, for for people like new rock stars just constantly say like everything's Mephisto and yeah. then for Jack Schaefer to come out with Agatha and be like no here's Mephisto yeah 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 that would be that... <laughs> be like what the, like, what? I'd be like oh see there you, and that would be the ultimate like dunk on them moment for the <laughs> show creators um it is also just interesting here's another potentially with powers teenager at a time when we're looking for young Avengers yeah. of which of which let's be real there just aren't any so there's two there's literally yeah. two <laughs> and that even they said well we need more of us well where's that coming from we don't know so uh that being said yeah uh i will say the end of the i wanted to pull this up the end of that episode because no oh, the 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 i gotta pull this cast up She's not listed here, but the actress who plays the mom in that 70s show, you know, she's with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deborah Jo Root. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. She's probably the other star power person in this yeah. besides us two. Uh, I really do like the, the dynamic between Catherine Hahn and uh, Aubrey Plaza because, quite frankly, that they were both in Parks and Rec. Now, both of their characters don't really interact that much in Parks and Rec, but they had like a mini get together of Parks and Rec people uh, on the red carpet for this show yeah. where, uh, where Amy Poehler was there, and then a Adam Scott just kind of came in out of yeah. nowhere, and I'm like, "Hey, there's the Pawnee Parks," and I love people were like, "Okay, Star Lord should have been there." Like, where's Chris yeah. Pratt? Where's yeah. our? Where's <laughs> arguably the most famous person from the Parks and Rec like cast like now? Uh, yeah. But but I thought that would have been crazy if they got that if they got him in there. But regardless, big Parks and Rec fan myself, like probably my favorite sitcom ever. But yeah, uh, I I mean I I there was enough there to see where it goes. I'll be honest, I actually really liked the song they sang at the end of that episode to, like, summon the road and get that open. I thought that was actually kind of cool. No, I mean, I, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree that, like... I like that way more than the power of many. I, I think... <laughs> I think this... this I, I liked the second episode because I thought I thought the the dynamic of the two... Of, 
of the uh, of Agatha and then the the, the, the kid team. going on like the journey to find these other witches was very funny. Uh, because she's like, "What are you doing?" She's like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, and then there there is that like they are layering in a lot of like curiosity, like with um they they first went to the like fortune teller mm -hmm. um div like divination witch who gave her the list of the of the other people and she ate it because there was a fourth name on there that she didn't want the teen to see and so and then and she went and just and then she just went and grabbed uh Deborah Jo Roop's character to like stand in for the other witch they didn't Yeah, have. I guess you just need the number. Yeah. And, and and so my thought is I interpreted that as she ended up killing the the earth witch that they needed to get mm. stole her power and so she was like we don't need the the other witch but we just need this other person that or and it's so rio somehow because rio said like someone with a, it just says a black heart and and you know in the first or the first episode or whatever yeah rio, rio says well i have a black heart you know what i mean and i'm like oh so is the ir irony here that they actually used be. to be friends like i don't yeah, yeah like did something ha so that was the way I interpreted it. I'm like, wait, so is that supposed to be Aubrey, but they just need that extra person. So let's just go grab this woman from down the street. Um, right. But I, but I didn't know. Right. That would make sense. But then I didn't know. Cause they, they made it seem like they needed the earth, which power. True. And, 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 and so, but I even don't then, know. but even then, so, so the cool, one of the coolest th sequences in Marvel's ever put out there, those like witches that are coming for Agatha, are, yeah. are appear there during the song yeah and i love that whole thing of like teen goes out to see what's going on and then the neighbor's like do you do you see what's happening here and then like they like split and then they show what the face looks like and i'm like oh that's actually terrifying like i was genuinely like oh that's yeah actually scary like that is disturbing imagery even for like disney plus and marvel stuff like like when they sh like in wandavision when they showed visions like dead body talking to wanda yeah that was like that levels of shocking to me. I was like, whoa, okay, that that's like a problem. And then they split and there's like seven of them and they're coming up. I'm like, oh wow, this is like heaving of the apocalypse. Like, <laughs> like this is this is terrifying. So they yeah, are, they, it, yeah. They remi it, re it reminded me of like the Dementors in Harry Potter. Yeah, yeah. It, I did see people making the comparisons. They they like like when they're breaking into the house, they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm like, oh whoa, this is actually these are actual horror elements. And again, not a big horror fan. But when horror elements are sprinkled into again, um, hammer home the severity of our situation, that is really cool. And I'm like, okay, house is boarded up. They are gonna, they are coming in. Like that. Is, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it's de it's definitely a, uh, it's definitely gearing up for a, a great Halloween themed show. Oh yeah, um, for this time of year. So oh, it's per it's great. And and I and I kind of honestly, it, it gave me thoughts of because uh, um, uh. uh Ahsoka happened during the fall too a year ago, and you get mm. the you get the zombie troopers, and I'm like, oh, this yeah. is this is Halloween. I think I remember even saying that to you a year ago. But uh, yeah, no, that was a really cool sequence. And then the road opens, but it's very clear that Agatha was just trying to steal their power because they all were like, she just wants to antagonize us and do yeah. this. And then it's like, oh, the hatch is open below us, and then they're going into it literally as one of those things is coming down the steps. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you might want to just close and leave. Like, just let's get out of here. And um and I and again, Agatha was an was an antagonist, and she still is like she's still not that likable of a character. I would imagine that's going to change over the course of this show. That being said, she was terrified of those things too, so it's significant. Oh, yeah, yeah, like she was scared of those things too, or else she wouldn't be doing this. It was one of those things of okay, so she's already a villainesque figure, and those terrify her too. Well, then that's a significant issue. It's like Witcher. It's like in the Witcher games where it's like other antagonists are all afraid of the wild hunt. Like that's always significant in storytelling where it's, it's like there's someone worse and I don't want to mess with them. So I thought that was interesting. But then, of course, they're on this road, which was pretty cool scenery. They all take their shoes off and then off they go. That's the end of the episode. Yeah, I mean, it. we'll see how this goes. But it yeah, definitely a lot of. um a lot of potential i think i think there was a lot of potential here i mean i i will say for for the uh expectation level for this show being the basement i think we've cleared that bar and and we're at least into like okay this could be entertaining that 
I, I agree, but I, I also preface this whole conversation by saying it is a mini series and it is classified as a mini series. I don't. Th- this isn't going to be a, an ongoing show. I really do think this is a right. one-off. No, right, right, right. Yeah, this there is no plans to take this any further. I, this is this is a let's do another werewolf by night type thing in the MCU and let's make it a series this time and let's just go full hocus pocus and it, make it. It, a it looks thing. like it's nine episodes. Um, mm-hmm. With the final two episodes being on October thirtieth, thirtieth um, or thirty first, thirtieth, just just thirtieth. So the day before Halloween, yep. that's pretty cool. I I I I like that. So this will be your kind of spooky season show that we'll get literally through October, which I appreciate. Um, there is enough here. Obviously, you and I will be talking about it, Case, and we may not talk about it every week, given the fact that October is the best sports month with baseball and other things coming up. But uh, we will give you our thoughts on it and ultimately give it a give it our solid tier four rating at the end. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's got some interesting things. And, and again, I don't we have what is considered a kind of a Marvel podcast. It's kind of one of those things where I could be harsher on this thing. But already this again, all the things we just trashed a show over the over the summer for for the things that had it wrong in, in, in um, the acolyte. Which, by the way, canceled. I know I mentioned, I made a joke about our last show, but that's canceled. It's not coming back. Uh, this is already, you know, much better written. I mean, it's Marvel, so it's different. It's literally a different franchise, but better written. Very interesting about what direction to take this. Uh, the budget looks pretty solid for this as well. The, like mm-hmm. the threats and the effects look real. I even loved the effects of the of the on the teen's mouth, like that. I re- I even loved that really little thing. So. Um. Yeah, that's 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 where we sit it right now. What are you What are you looking up? So there, I I just want. So I did you know what those things were at the end of the episode? The, those things. What do you mean? The, the the witches that sh- like the things that showed up at the house to go. I genuinely them. did not know what they were. I okay. Rio, do you want Rio to explain mentioned. It? Go ahead. Rio yeah. mentioned what they were at the beginning. Yeah. I figured. So they, okay. They they are the Salem Seven. Mm. Um, in which case there were hints of it in the first episode during the like alternate t- like universe yep. things. But Ag- so getting into like the comic lore of it, the Salem seven are a fictional team of magical beings and former supervillains. Uh, all seven are the children of Nicholas Scratch and the grandchildren of Agatha Harkness. Interesting. In the comics. In the comics, yeah. So hmm. in the show, like you saw the moment to where, like, Ag- to where, like the the detective version of Agatha like goes into like a a, a child's bedroom, and the things say Nicholas Scratch on it, mm-hmm. and so that that is Agatha's son, um, and so these Salem Seven are essentially, I guess, um, magical beings that that hunt that that are hunting her. Yeah, for some um, reason, are, yeah. And and we'll see if they're if they do the thing where they are in some way related to her. Um that it yeah, it, it sounds like they essentially are going after like they, they went through the um Salem witch trials and stuff, and so they're I, I don't I don't know if there's some kind of magic police or something and are and are like kind of hunting people who abuse magic. I don't really know, but Right. And and, um, and we are noticing that like the book that is the Dark Hold and the effects it's had yeah. on the characters that we know. I mean, and even and even like one of my favorite things in at the it was literally the end of Multiverse of Madness when he grows the third eye because like the idea being you can't mm-hmm. mess with this book for any amount of time and it doesn't corrupt you in some way. I liked that. Like, no, it's an evil book. Like, you really should not mess with this. Um, we know that there's a price to pay if you mess with the dark hold, and that's exactly what Agatha's been doing for all that time. You know, in that basement of that house and stuff. So. Um, interesting stuff. I mean, when, when the, when the threat presented itself, I was like, oh no, this show is going to go in some directions. It's not just going to be like a quirky witches show. Like, oh no, there's some real threats here. That's terrifying what they showed at the end of that episode. Yeah. So yeah. So very interesting stuff. And, uh, we'll be talking about it more. So was there anything more to explain on that or no? Oh, uh, no, that was, yeah, that was all I had. Cool. Well, that's all we have on the docket as well. Uh, thank you, everyone, as always, so much for listening, watching, however you consume. Um, 
Kaysen, any final thoughts on things? I appreciate, uh, appreciate again, your flexibility just as, as things go here. Uh, still, still, I, I'm, I'm about a month into my new location, but you wouldn't know by the, by the, the corner I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Any, any parting thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's good to be back with football season and, and we're getting new Marvel content. Uh, and so we getting back in the start of things and it's great. Feels like fall really feels like yeah. fall. And, it, and it's actually going to feel like fall by our next show. Since I'm pretty sure our next show is probably going to drop in October. So yeah, <laughs> most definitely. So, uh, that being said, uh, yeah, we will, uh, we'll be here for you and we'll uh, continue the conversation when we're back. That being said, this is Kellen. This is Kaysen. And we'll see you as always at the next stop.